I think an A-10 with shark's teeth on the front, like now we're talking. Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. King Campbell set her sights on being an Air Force pilot at an early age. She not only achieved her goal of flying the A-10 in combat, but she led squadrons and Air Force groups throughout her career. While her experience over Baghdad on the 6th of April 2003, when she was hit by a surface-to-air missile, is one of the most talked about aspects of her long career, the lessons that she learned on multiple deployments to Afghanistan and Baghdad, raising a young family, teaching at the academy that she had fought and so hard to attend, Kim is articulated into a fascinating and really positive book, which is called Flying in the Face of Fear. With that wealth of frontline experience, there is a lot that we can take away from the lessons that Kim learnt and apply in our everyday lives. And some of the aspects of the book, I've been looking to see how I can use to control some of my more prickly aspects in the day job. Me? Prickly? You'd never believe it, would you? So I'm delighted to welcome Kim Campbell to the Damcasters to discuss her career, some of those lessons that she talks about in her book, and of course, flying the mighty A-10 itself. But we've got to start with the easy question, why the Air Force? Well, for me, I decided I wanted to join the Air Force primarily because my goal was to be an astronaut someday. Uh, I had watched the launch of the Space Shuttle Challenger when I was in fifth grade. And despite the tragedy that played out in front of us, I think there was something for me in that moment that I realized that, you know, these astronauts died doing something that they believed in, that there was this thrill and this exhilaration of flight with the launch. Uh, it was just, I think it was exciting for me to see and to recognize that there is there are things out there that are bigger and more important than just you as an individual. Mm -hmm. And I decided then in fifth grade, that's what I wanted to do. And I felt like going to the Air Force Academy, becoming a fighter pilot was my path to becoming an astronaut. Little did I know how much I would actually enjoy what I did in the Air Force, um, so much so that I, I didn't want to leave it. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit a few grades behind you because I remember watching that at school as well because her name's gone straight to my head. It was the first time the teacher f was to fly. Krista McCullough. Krista McCullough, yeah. yeah. So I think every school, I was in Canada at the time, so I think every school in North America had dragged everybody in early yeah. for that launch. It was it was terrible. But I, I totally get what you're saying. There is that, what drove these people to be there to, to do that despite the dangers and things? Um, 100%. But in reading your book, it was it was really great, great to see. As as someone who has very little drive to read someone who had focused their efforts on it, because it wasn't a smooth road for you to get to the academy, was it? It you know, you you were you had your you had your determination, you were you're doing the sports, you're doing all the right things. It didn't quite go to plan initially. Did it? No, it did not. <laughs> uh, I I committed everything I had to going to the Air Force Academy, and I I worked hard in school. I had the sports. I I had all the extracurricular activities. Uh, I didn't do so well on the standardized test, uh, the SAT as we call it, um, and so that I knew that was a little bit of a struggle for me. But I hoped it was good enough. Uh, unfortunately, it was not. I got a rejection letter from the Air Force Academy instead of that long-awaited uh, acceptance letter. And I decided that uh, that didn't matter. <laughs> I still wanted to go to the Academy. And thankfully, with the support of coaches, mentors, my liaison officer for the Air Force Academy, everybody just said, look, if this is what you want, keep after it. Don't quit. And so I didn't. I wrote the Air Force Academy a letter every week, letting them know that I was still interested, that this is still something that I wanted to do. And if they had a spot that opened up, I would happily take it. I also told them that I could do, you know, if I could do 10 more push ups or pull ups, whatever it was that I had improved on. And I finally took a different standardized test, the ACT, and did much better on that. I think that was probably the biggest factor. But eventually I got the long awaited acceptance letter. It was a late offer of appointment to attend the Air Force Academy, and it came just two weeks before I was supposed to go to basic training. So uh, not what I had planned, but uh, it, it worked out in the end. 
how did some of your heroes along the way play into that determination? Because um, uh, yeah. I know when we were chatting before, I, Eileen Collins came up and I reread her book before I read yours or just after I read yours to get that sort of frame. And as a hero, as heroes go, she's a pretty good one to have. How, how did her example help you through that that tricky time? Well, her, I mean, her example really came later for me. Mm. I mean, I had an opportunity to connect with her uh, after I had graduated from the Air Force Academy and I was a second lieutenant. Uh, I was there in Houston on an internship at, at Johnson Space Center. And she, um, you know, she she didn't know it at the time. I mean, I just got to sit in the back and kind of be the fly on the wall as she debriefed a mission um, her mission where she was the first female shuttle commander. And I just listened and watched and saw how she, you know, interacted with her team, how she took accountability. I mean, it was just impressive to sit and watch uh, this woman do something and hold herself to a very high standard. And, uh, you know, especially for someone that wanted to go on someday to be an astronaut, to see that, to be a part of it. Um, you know, she, she played an influential role in terms of my future in the Air Force, in terms of watching how she responded in a moment, how she like held her team together, how she took accountability for what they were doing on that mission. So she really played more of a part later in my career. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, those opportunities are few and far between, and you never really know when you're going to impact someone's life. You've sort of structured the book around various sort of traits to sort of to build upon and to develop and to to, to refine and the sort of the, the opening sections are sort of the headwinds and grit you call them. How do you feel that grit? Actually, let's change that. What would you define grit as? And because clearly it's not the stuff that gets between your toes at the beach. <laughs> I think for me, I look at it as like you are going to face failures in your life. You are going to make mistakes. You're going to get knocked down. Grit to me is can you get back up again? You know, when you're faced with the adversity. When you're faced with challenge, can you get knocked down and then get back up again and get back into the game, get back into the fight? To me, that's what grit is all about. Fantastic. So let's get to the academy because you were there at an interesting time because it's uh, you were there in 93 was your right. entry. That's not long after the academy's sort of opened up and it's still changing with the, the Air Force accepting more, more women through it. What were your first impressions when you when you arrived? just down the road yeah. from you now in Colorado. Yeah, I honestly I when I decided I was going to be a fighter pilot, which was 1986, I had no idea that women weren't allowed to be fighter pilots. Like that didn't even <laughs> cross my mind. Uh, my parents never told me that. They just said, "All right, if that's what you want to do, work hard, you know, go after it." Uh, I figured it out later in high school um, when I was in a speech and debate class and we were talking about women in combat. And I realized that this path that I had planned to take wasn't uh, necessarily going to be this easy road. And, you know, thankfully, by the time I graduated from high school and went to the Air Force Academy, women were allowed to be fighter pilots. That combat exclusion was lifted. So by the time I got to the Air Force Academy, I mean, it was new for women to be allowed to do some of these combat roles. Um, there were about 16% women at the Air Force Academy at the time. We're up at about 30% now, um, so it's improved, but uh, we were at about 16% women. I don't know that uh, for me, it was just, I knew I had to go and be ready. Like I knew it was going to be hard. I didn't really focus on the fact that I was going to be, you know, a minority I think my dad did, though. I think he knew. <laughs> uh, my dad had been an Air Force Academy graduate, and uh, there were no women there when he went there. So he was very committed to making sure that I was going to be ready, and he knew how hard it was going to be. So we ran the hills in San Jose, California in our combat boots together. Uh, he installed a pull-up bar in my bathroom so that I could gain this upper body strength. I mean, he just wanted me to be physically prepared. He knew that I had the mental toughness, but I think he just knew that if I went in physically prepared, that would make a huge difference. And it it really did. I mean, I proved very early on that I I could hang in all the runs, the athletic events, those kind of things. And I think that really set me up for success there. Now, going to the US Air Force Academy is not like going to a normal university where your first couple of weeks are, how much can I drink and survive? There has something called beast. What is beast? 
Yeah. Beast is uh, basic cadet training. We call it beast uh, because that's what it is. It's a beast to go through. It's uh, it is our training uh, that lasts a couple months. Uh, we spend time learning about military and kind of breaking us down as individuals and building us up as a team. Uh, it's a lot of athletic and physical fitness. Um, it's one of those things that you go through it and you are excited to be done and you never want to go through it again. <laughs> It, it just sounded terrible reading reading about it in your book. And it's a rite of passage. It's part of every military's initial training. I mean, it's it's all about showing you what the military is about, making sure you have what it takes. Are you willing to go through this hard thing? You know, can you overcome the adversity, the challenge, and persevere through? Because if you can't, we might as well weed you out early. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. So what goals did you set yourself for the Academy besides, you know, clearly graduating fighter pilot as that experience through those years, what were you setting yourself as sort of incremental steps to get you to where you wanted to be? I think being rejected from the Air Force Academy meant that my goals were maybe a little bit different than some of the other cadets. I feel like sometimes you get there and you're like, I just got to survive this place. I just got to get through so I can be a fighter pilot on the outside. I felt like I wanted to prove myself while I was there. Like I wanted to excel because I had worked so hard to get in. I had been rejected. I finally got that late offer of appointment. And so I was all about, I wanted to excel. I wanted to push myself. And uh, I decided that I would take on some cadet leadership roles. I had to apply for them, but I ended up uh, being the cadet wing commander, which is the highest ranking cadet responsible for all 4,000 cadets. And I will tell you that really set the stage for the rest of my career because it was my first opportunity to really lead and set the example and learn from others. And believe me, I did not get it right. I made plenty of mistakes in that leadership role. Thankfully, I had mentors. I had senior enlisted mentors. I had general officer mentors. I had a whole bunch of people that were willing to provide advice and assistance and, and offer some thoughts. So I learned a tremendous amount. And I'm glad I did it, despite the fact that it was sometimes painful and a lot of extra work. Uh, and uh, it's hard to lead your peers. Uh, let's just say that. It's a it's an incredibly demanding environment anyway. And now you put a leadership role on top of that. It was, was definitely challenging, but I'm so glad I did it. It really set me up for success later as a leader as well. And I guess a competitive environment as well, because there would be other people wanting that role as well and trying to excel and things. So how did, how did the knocks you took along the way sort of set you up for future leadership roles that we're going to chat yeah. about in a bit? It's interesting because the academy is, a, it's a competitive environment. You're working to improve your class standing because when it comes time for pilot slots, it's based on your class standing and where, how you've performed. So it is competitive, but you also can't survive without being part of the team, right? They very much drill into you that you don't succeed as an individual. You succeed as a team. Uh, so it's an interesting environment, but that was the same environment I faced at pilot training where you realize and learn that you have to work together. You have to support each other. You have to encourage each other. You have to push each other. You have to motivate each other. But you're also being individually evaluated for your performance. And that determines really the rest of your career. Uh, it's a really interesting environment, but it teaches us to work together as a team while also pushing ourselves to absolutely uh, perform at our highest level. So that's what you sort of describe is that the being a wingman early on in it. So before even the, the, where our heads would be with, yeah, Top Gun, you can be my wingman anytime. Yeah. <laughs> even, even at that early stage, you're, you're building that camaraderie for it. So for you, what does that sort of wingman mentality mean to you in those sorts of environments or something that we can apply to, to our day to day? Yeah, I think, you know, we learned very early on that it was all about supporting your wingman, right? You're this idea of a wingman culture that you support each other, you have each other's back, you push each other. And it's this whole concept. We talk about developing leaders of character at the Air Force Academy. And there is this individual part of living honorably and absolutely performing at your best. But it's also about lifting others so that you can elevate the performance of the team. And that's the whole idea is that, you know, this wingman concept, you lift each other, you push each other, you motivate each other to perform at your absolute best. And then that results in 
higher performance and elevating the performance of the team. I think that applies across the board. Uh, and that and that's something we learned very early on in our careers. So it, it's helping, it's supporting, it's empowering as as much as just keeping an eye on someone. It is, you know, and that's something we learned at the Air Force Academy. I will tell you, once I went on to become a fighter pilot, I really understood what being a true wingman meant. I mean, we learned about the what actually having, you know, that wingman culture and being a good wingman and being in position and doing all of the things that you're supposed to do correct. You know, you're on the radios, you're in position, you're doing your job at the absolute best, but you are also providing mutual support. You also have a very critical role to look out for threats to make sure your flight lead is safe, to give information to your flight lead as needed. So it really adapted and evolved over time. And I really saw what it meant uh, once I actually got into the flying community. Quick wrap up. Was the Bring Us Men ramp still there when when you were there? And if it was, what does that say to you? As as, as you're saying, as as a minority, as, as a woman going into it, is that saying we're going to change that or is that something that just drives you to, to prove yourself? You know, that the bring me men ramp had been there for, you know, a long time. And when I showed up to basic training, that's the ramp I walked up, uh, was the bring me men ramp. I always looked at it as a poem. I mean, it was a poem by Samuel Walter Foss. It was, you know, bring me men to match my mountains, bring me men to match my majesty. It it goes on. I won't go through the whole thing, but I mean, the whole point to me was it was a poem. I didn't, I personally did not have an issue with it. I didn't really think much of it. Uh, I will tell you that, I mean, other people did. I, when I led the cadet wing, 4,000 cadets marching down the ramp to the parade field and I'm leading the wing with 4,000 people behind me for parents weekend. I remember this one mom yelling out, look at you, young lady, you're leading all those men down the bring me men ramp. And, you know, it just, it was funny. I just, it's not something that I ever thought of or made a big deal of. I mean, it is, it has changed today um, because it's, uh, you know, it, it, it really did upset some people and offended some people. And so the Academy made the decision to change it, but it was there when I was there. And I don't know, I just know it's not something I focused on. I was just so focused on performing at the Academy and doing my best. That was just a, I don't know, a minor thing in the scheme of things. It just, it didn't bother me at all. So graduation comes, your mom and dad pin your bar on. How did that feel to you? Is that a beginning or an end of a chapter in your life? Did you feel both? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's the end of four years, the end of a, you know, a journey at the Air Force Academy, but also just the beginning. I mean, the, I had made it through the Academy, I'd gotten through that point, but really my journey as an Air Force officer was just beginning. I mean, this was just the start. So the next section of your book, I found really interesting because it's, you call it the fighter pilot mindset. And I have worked with some ex vice pilots and I wouldn't always say they have the best mindset, but in reading your book, I was totally guessing what you were saying. So you're joining flight training 1999. You're one of, I think you said it was 33 um, female fighter pilots in, in yeah. the USAF at the time. How is that? Does that do anything to you? Does that drive you to work harder or is it all the stuff that you've been doing to get to the academy to get through does that just continue on because you've reached that goal you've you're going to be a fighter pilot i think for me i mean i i still knew that i was in that minority crowd and i really wanted to prove myself i i think i knew that you know walking into my fighter squadron knowing that i would be the only female fighter pilot i put a lot of pressure on myself because i didn't want to ruin it uh, for the women that followed me, right? I mm-hmm. felt like this is, you know, these are my words that I would r- potentially ruin it for women after me if I made mistakes, if I failed. And so I put a lot of pressure on myself. I think, you know, there's goodness in that and that I worked really hard. I studied, I was in the vault. I, you know, I just, I put everything I had into it. Um, but the truth is like the guys in my squadron truly just cared that I could perform in the airplane. These were academy classmates of mine. They they had seen me perform at the academy. They just wanted me to be able to perform in the airplane like any new wingman is expected to do. Uh, so I think 
sometimes we're really hard on ourselves when we don't have to be. Um, I certainly was, you know, I wish I would have enjoyed the journey a little bit more Mm -hmm. along the way uh, in those early days, but I was so focused on my performance and performing well. And whether I, you know, wanted to or not, uh, I got to prove myself very early in my career in combat, which is really the ultimate test. Mm -hmm. Was there a moment when you felt I've got this? Um, I don't know if I've, (laughs) I don't know if you ever feel that way, right? Like you get to the point you're like, oh, I've got this. I'm a pretty good wingman. And they're like, Hey, now we want you to upgrade to flight lead. And then you're a flight lead and you're like, oh, I got this. I can lead a two ship of A-10s. And then they're like, well, now it's time to upgrade to four ship and, you know, and then instructor and then evaluator. It's like this never ending, you know, you just, when you feel like you're at the peak, it's time for something else. (laughs) So As for something else, call signs. You had a couple. Your first one was bags, wasn't it? Yeah. Why why were you (laughs) called bags? I'm bringing this up only because I saw you tweet about it earlier. I know, I know. (laughs) I uh, I only share it because I know it it helps other people. um, You know, you like to share things about yourself that are um, hopefully somebody can learn from it. But uh, yeah, I got air sick so many times in my flight training. (laughs) I used a lot of air sickness bags, so I got the call sign bags. But I survived that. Right? I um, it was miserable. I I tell so many of these young pilots who are so discouraged. They're like, I got air sick. Like it happened once, like, and it happened again. And it happened, you know, it happened so many times for me. Um, you know, and it, it lets you, uh, it lets doubt in, you know, can you do this? Can you make it? Is it worth it? Like it's miserable to feel sick in an airplane, but eventually I got over it. You know, I eventually figured out how to beat it. And, uh, for me, it was time. Um, but it's a hard thing and it makes you question and doubt everything that you want to do, uh, but so worth it in the end. And, uh, you know, to this day, I have found that if I am at the controls, I am much better off than sitting in the back seat. So I generally, um, I'm very appreciative of the rides to sit in the back seat of some of these amazing airplanes, but my answer is generally no. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the call sign that stuck? Well, the call sign that stuck was, uh, you'll get many names throughout your career until you actually get designated as combat mission ready in your airplane. So once I got to the A-10 community, I went through all my um, kind of initial checkout to be combat mission ready. Uh, My uh, squadron gave me a call sign. Uh, There is a, you know, there's some idea that pilots name themselves, and that is not true. We get, uh, you know, we get a call sign chosen for us sometimes based on things that we do in the airplane, sometimes a playoff of our name, whatever it may be. But uh, we're generally not in the room. They tell stories about you while you're out of the room and then you come back in. (laughs) And I remember walking back in, it was in the bar on a Friday night in our fighter squadron. And they, you know, the whole squadron erupts in cheers and they tell me that my call sign is now Killer Chick or KC for short. So that one stuck. (laughs) (laughs) We, you've mentioned it a few times now, and I I adore the A-10. I, I spend far too much time reading about Second World War ground attack aircrafts. It's namesake, the, the P-47, and of course, my passion, the, the Hawker Typhoon. You chose the A-10 as the aircraft that you wanted to fly. Why did you choose that one? I chose it based on the mission. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Um, you know, I was in pilot training when I made my decision uh, in 1999 before September 11th, 2001. Um, to me, you know, I had no idea how that would change everything, but I chose based on the mission. I love the idea of supporting troops on the ground. I love the idea that what I did could make a difference and help people get home back to their families. That was a mission that I connected with. And, I also love the low-level missions at pilot training, I'll be honest. Uh, You know, the formation work was okay. Uh, It was kind of cool, but I love the low-level missions. So for me, it was kind of this passion, but also this mission that really connected with me. And I I, I absolutely love flying the A-10. I remember seeing it for the first time in 91 when everyone was coming back from from Desert Storm and they they popped in two, a two-ship came to the Biggin Hill Air Show. And uh, did a display. And I remember uh, walking up to it with my dad and my dad going, my goodness, that's an ugly airplane. And, <laughs> and I looked at it. I just went that. And I went, no, it's not. It's beautiful. 
and the pilot stood next to it went come here kid and you know sh- showed me around and did all that which was fantastic looking back what sort of emotions pop to mind when you when you think of your your aircraft that you spent so many years with in in combat and, and flying yeah uh, I mean, I think it is beautiful, right? It's not your sleek, sexy, shiny new airplane, but uh, I mean, it does its mission like no other airplane can. I mean, it obviously, it kept me safe uh, flying combat missions. So I'm definitely attached to that airplane. I think an A-10 with shark's teeth on the front, like now we're talking. Like to me, that's that was my first airplane that I ever flew, an A-10 with shark's teeth. And there's just something about that airplane that I think is special in terms of there's such a strong bond between an A-10 pilot and the ground troops because of what we do. And it's just, there is a huge community that is very passionate about the airplane, uh, pilots and ground crew and ground crew included. Uh, it's just, it's something that we're passionate about because it's such, it's been such an incredible airplane. It's played, played such a huge role in saving people's lives. And it seems like it's irreplaceable. <laughs> yeah, the, the arguments are definitely there for that. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections, Andrew Bowley. Here we are again at the Pima Air and Space Museum. Um, we are inside one of our exhibits that we call the Bing. So you might ask, what is the Bing? So during Operation Enduring Freedom, the early first couple years of A-10 operations in Afghanistan. One of the first units uh, built uh, one of those temporary structures that were all over the place. I think they're called knee huts, if I recall correctly. And they turned it into what they called the Bing, which was kind of like a lounge slash clubby area for the A-10 pilots. Why was it called the Bing? Well, it was named after the strip club and the Sopranos. And that's why it was called the Bing, because that was when the Sopranos was going going on and was really popular. The interesting thing is the first unit was very specific that they wanted no televisions, no you know, video games, computers, anything. It was a place to kind of, you know, have some drinks, relax, play some music. They left a code of honor saying no televisions, no video games, etc with a photo of the cast of the Sopranos, you know, just threaten them. So what did the next squadron do? Well, they put in a television and started playing video games. So <clears throat> that's what's kind of interesting about the Bing is kind of this interestingly organic kind of thing that happens during the war that just kind of becomes different things and expands as it goes on. So, it, you know, it was in multiple iterations because A-10s were, you know, in Bagram, Kandahar. So they would take all the stuff off the walls move it down to their next designation and put everything up. Um, a lot of the stuff is just random stuff off the being. It's a lot like a college dorm room. You know, you have your, you know, velvet Elvis artwork um, that looks straight out of a night, you know, 90s college classroom. The, the plaques that you see along the walls with the squadron deployments and everything, those were actually not in the being. They were in their ops shack, but they brought all those back. So again, you know, stealing signs, putting them up on the walls. Um, every time an A-10 pilot did a deployment to Afghanistan, they left one of their name tags or patches on the wall. So if you did more than one, then you left more than one. So some people you'll see multiple ones. Uh, you see some exchange pilots from um, foreign air forces that were flying A-10s. Um, I have to say this was a really fun exhibit to work on because it's a little different than the typical, um, you know, uniforms flight gear. And talking with the A-10 guys, they were really, really good about sharing information and being kind of open about things, you know. Like the bars had places to hide alcohol because technically they weren't supposed to bring alcohol into Afghanistan. So, you know, they would put, have alcohol sent to them in Listerine bottles and stuff like that and then hide them in here. Another interesting thing is um, they had a pink flamingo that whenever they were doing stuff like well, drinking or doing whatever they don't want their CEO to know about, they would put a pink flamingo outside the bing just to let the commanding officer know that now would not be a good time to enter the bing. But it's in, the, guys who, uh, the guys that we worked with on this exhibit were really good and really interesting. and. Uh, I had a lot of fun doing this exhibit, or we all had a lot of fun doing this exhibit. And now, back to the show. 
there's a lovely dis- discussion in your book where you discuss chair flight. And I guess with the, the hog as well, it's a pure solo aircraft. There's no two seated right. trainer. You, you can jump. What is chair flying and how, how does that sort of apply your focus for a difficult, difficult task ahead? So chair flying is my one piece of advice when people ask, how do I survive pilot training? Not just military, but any flight school, right, is uh, is to chair fly. And chair flying is uh, in, in the old school, right? When we're talking uh, pre-virtual reality days, uh, <laughs> we sit in the chair, we have a printed out picture of the cockpit in front of us, and we just visualize, we walk through the procedures. We talk through the radio calls. We think about our maneuver parameters. It allows us to visualize and plan for a mission practice before we actually get in the cockpit. And for me, it was like this freebie. Like I would go through all of this the night before I flew and the next morning and I would get in the airplane and go execute, but I had thought through it before. Uh, And then for me, when I was dealing with air sickness, well, at least, you know, I could, I had I really was performing well still because I had gone through all these procedures the night before. Um, It's absolutely essential. And for me, what I've realized is that chair flying concept really applies to any difficult or stressful situation that you face in life. You take the time to visualize and think through it in advance. You walk through kind of what you're going to say, what you're going to do, how you're going to act. And then you think about kind of those contingencies, the worst case scenarios, and uh, really think through those and and think about what we'll do. And it, for me, I just found that I was so much better prepared once I got into the airplane the next day. I didn't put this in, but I'm going to ask it now. You had the the situation where in, in the Sims and things, you, I think it was in the Sim that you, you switched off the wrong engine during a, yeah. <laughs> a, a thing. That sort of thing, I guess, would then apply into uh, things like chair flying as well. All those little little things that you go right this isn't going to happen but if it does this is the process and i guess for yeah someone like me preparing for something it's remembering the the previous mistakes and how i wished i'd handled them better is that that sort of thing where you can then visualize and almost replay and do better the next time that's a terrible way of putting it but no but it's true you do ideally you are going to do it better the next time i feel like we can spend a lot of time thinking about like the worst case scenarios. We can drive ourselves crazy with the what ifs, what if, what if. So for me, what I found is when I start getting into that mindset of like, what if this happens? What if this goes wrong? Then I actually like, <laughs> talk, I, I walk myself through it. Like, okay, what if it does? What are you going to do? You know, I think that's for me is that you think about what you're going to do in that moment. And then you have a little bit of idea and then you can kind of, tuck it away. You're like, all right, I've thought about that one. I can stop thinking about it. I can stop worrying about it because I've thought about what I'm going to do. And in that moment, when something like it happens or similar, you kind of reach back to that memory and go, I've thought about this before. I know what I'm going to do. If you don't get it right, then you know, like you're talking about, you learn from your mistakes, you do it differently the next time. I mean, that debrief is a huge piece of what we do as fighter pilots. But I have found for me that planning for contingencies, thinking about those things that could go wrong, not just thinking about them, but having a plan of what to do with them, that has helped me personally and professionally throughout my career. Because that's the sort of bookend, isn't it? It's the the preparation and and then it's the the debrief as well. And I guess taking a, a business lesson from it, that's something we tend not to do in I almost said the real world there. That's terrible. I'm sorry. Well, no, I mean, but you're right. I think you have to be intentional about it. And you're right. It's this cycle. It is, for me, it's the preparation. So you prepare, you practice by chair flying, visualizing, you plan for contingencies, you go out, you execute, you debrief, and then you do it all again. Mm-hmm. You take all those lessons and that goes now into your preparation for the next thing. Yeah, because I I think we got so into the habit of of taking actions as opposed to looking at a retrospective action as well to to see whether or not those were the correct ones we should be taking from it based upon what we've done. Well, it takes time. It takes time to debrief. And Mm -hmm. unless you're intentional about it, it likely falls through the cracks. But debriefs from a fighter pilot perspective, I mean, we're focusing on what we did well, maybe not as much, but what we did well, so we could do it again the next time. But we really drill down into those mistakes. What did we, you know, what mistakes did we make and why? Why Mm -hmm. did we make those mistakes? What happened? Really drilling down into that root cause, pulling the lessons learned, and then, you know, coming up with a plan of how we're going to do it differently the next Mm -hmm. time. Because all of that really 
especially in the role that you're in in the A10, which is providing close support to to troops on the ground. That's when a lot of this is going to be vital because your margin for error is tiny. Um, so what is that sort of preparation process? Because I guess one of the things that jumped out at me in the book is there was cases when you had time to prepare, and then there was other times when you received the call and you had to go. To take the latter, how do you sort of mentally apply those things that you've practiced beforehand when you don't have a lot of time to sit and go, this is possibly what's going to happen. You've got to get in the air, get overhead, and then assess the situation. Yeah, I think, you know, one thing for A-10 pilots is that flexibility is absolutely essential for us. Mm -hmm. We have to rely on kind of those basic building blocks and then adjust real time. And being able to adjust on the fly, part of that is the planning for contingencies. On all of our training missions, we induce some sort of like problem or error or something, you know, some critical situation on the ground. We try to do that over and over and over again so that when it comes time to that moment where you don't have a lot of time to plan, you launch, you barely know where you're going. You have a set of coordinates and a radio frequency and you check in and they're like, here's the situation we're really taught it's part of our training to be able to adapt and adjust and think real time about what to do in that moment. So it, it really is a fallback onto some basic building blocks of our training. The other thing that struck me as well was you, you talk about when knowing to attack, when knowing not to, that sort of the urgency versus pre precision thing. I was wanted to ask about the human aspect of that because you're listening to men and women on the ground in contact you listen to that with the radio and there's the one case that you talk about where you couldn't provide the support because of potential collateral damage there. I guess as a person and as someone who has chosen this role in this aircraft for helping, what is it like working through that process when you know that you can't actually do that? Well, I mean, I think it's at various, we're looking at it at various levels. Can I drop a, can I drop bombs on that area? No, but what can I do? You know, what are my alternate courses of action? Maybe I can use forward firing ordinance where I'm very now very precise. Is it going to be necessarily as effective based on a larger target area? You know, those are all the questions we're asking ourselves. Or, you know, does it come down to, well, we can't actually drop anything or shoot anything because of potential collateral damage, or we don't have enough information to kind of assess the situation so instead, we're going to do a show of force and we're going to fly over. We're going to be low. We're going to be loud. We're going to drop flares. Uh, you know, we just we kind of we've learned how to escalate. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then there are the situations where you accept certain levels of risk depending on the situation. So I think really the key is, can you adapt? Can you adjust? Can you think outside the box? Can you think creatively of how can you support these troops on the ground in a way that will help them within the constraints that you're given? Um, and I, I think that's the thing is not getting so wed to a plan that you think you absolutely have to execute it this way, that it's like, well, the situation's different. I'm going to have to adjust. And what are the options that I have? Okay. Show of force. The question every A-10 pilot gets asked, what was it like firing the gun for the first time? I don't think you're actually an A-10 pilot until you shoot the gun for the first time. I think that's like this rite of passage. Um, but it's a, it's it's like an overwhelming experience. I mean, so many pilots, I, I've been an instructor uh, in the airplane at our early training unit as well. And, you know, half the time a student will, sh will pull the trigger on the gun and they'll actually come off after like a, a fraction of a second because they've scared themselves. They surprise <laughs> themselves by the reaction of the gun. Um, but you, when you pull the trigger, you know, you're rolling in, you're pointing at the ground, you're space stabilized, you pull that trigger and the whole jet shakes. I mean, it rumbles beneath you. Uh, you can smell the gun gases. You can see them out in front of you. I mean, it is just a full experience and it is loud. I mean, it is really, really loud. So uh, it's uh, it's impressive. And then ideally you see um, the sparkles. People laugh at the term sparkles, but that's what it is because they're target practice rounds against metal and they're little sparkles that hit the target. <laughs> now, if it's an actual target, a little different because that will ignite and it's more of an explosion. It's a little bit more uh, exciting. But in training, the first time, ideally, you see the sparkles. You you were involved in a lot of the, the testing and the upgrade of the aircraft as well from, from the A model on. How How is the aircraft progressed? Because it's, you know, essentially the same airframe with lots of new 
boxes essentially be thrown into it on your time on the aircraft how did how did she develop and how more effective did she become during yeah. your, your time on it well the uh the you know the airframe itself stayed the same i'm still the same reliable trustworthy durable airplane uh, but now we have capability that really brought us up to speed with some of the other fighter aircraft out there um you know gosh there's so many things that improved I'll talk about some of my favorites, I guess. Um, I think, you know, to have these digital displays with moving maps and fully integrated systems, the helmet mounted queuing system, you know, now the time it takes to gather information about a situation, about targets, about friendlies and get them into our system and find them. We're so much faster. I mean, think about the early days of Operation Iraqi Freedom. We are overhead looking for targets with space stabilized binoculars and paper maps. I mean, you're trying to look at a paper map, look on the ground and with your binoculars while you're flying and, and find these targets. Now, imagine now I've got a targeting pod. I can get the coordinates into the system very quickly and my helmet, my targeting pod, everything slews to that position and I can see it outside. I can see it in my systems and now I can target it with laser guided bombs or GPS guided bombs. We are just more efficient. We're more effective. Um, and really what it comes down to is we can save more lives on the ground. So it's, it's taking a lot of, I don't want to say pressure, but the, the sort of the Mark one computer computations out so that you're able to rationalize and make better decisions rather than working out the math for a specific problem. Yeah, it does that. I mean, I, I kind of equate it to like, uh, you know, the, the, remember, uh, the old like rotary phones, and then you went to a smartphone. <laughs> like, uh, I mean, there are, th there are a lot of more things that you have the capability to do now. It's, uh, it's faster to dial a number. Like it's just, you know, it was hard for us to initially transition and kind of trust the technology. Um, I think, you know, it's, we all believe it's still important. Can you read a, can you read the paper map? Can you get yourself someplace <laughs> and still figure it out? Um, but to have this technology, to have some of these systems, um, I think the, the other, one of the other key systems was um, the new chaff, uh, our chaff flare, our countermeasure system. I mean, we went from kind of the, you know, manual, you push the button, the chaff layer comes out to now the system can sense an infrared signature. It can sense a missile being shot at an aircraft and put out chaff and flare for you and then and let you know that it's happening. So then you can maneuver the aircraft. Uh, that would have made a huge difference for me. It would have made a huge <laughs> difference for many pilots in Operation Desert Storm. So the technology change has just been tremendous. It's, um, you know, so many key systems on the aircraft have been upgraded to really bring it up to a, a level of um, a very efficient and effective performance. Not to say that we weren't before, but now we can be faster. We can get in there quicker. We can ideally service more situations, more troops on the ground that need help. I specifically said to you that I, I, I didn't particularly want to talk to you too much about what happened on the 6th of April when you were, were hit over Baghdad. But in reading your book, you have the scene where you saw your crew chief and he welcomed you back. I want to know what he said when he saw the aircraft, because maintainers are, are special beasts. And I'm sure he was very, very happy to see you home safe. But when yeah, you brought his I, airplane I don't back, know. In a bit of a I'll mess. have to ask him. <laughs> I, I, we're still in touch today. But, um, you know, I left the airplane on the runway um, because it had to be towed clear. So when I saw him, I, I was in a car, like I got driven to the parking spot, but the airplane wasn't with me. I got out and, you know, he, he was just super excited to see me. And, and, uh, but I don't know what he said when he <laughs> saw the airplane, I can only imagine, uh, you know, I did apologize for, uh, for bringing it back with so many holes in it, but, um, yeah, I haven't, I don't know. I'll have to ask him, uh, cause we're, we're still in touch today. So it'd be interesting to know exactly what he said. I have a few guesses, but probably not appropriate for the, uh, mm. the listeners. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing lots of short words. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. The reason I wanted to, to move forward was really because the, the sort of the latter section of your books around that sort of transition into leadership roles, the, the wiggling your fingers and your toes, I found fascinating. And if you look at all my little posted -y things that I put in <laughs> I it, it. <laughs> it, it, it's quite heavy towards the end because I did the classic thing of getting my first sort of you know, project lead role and fell flat on my face. It was not pretty. But I guess 
throughout, you, you know, you're talking about at the academy, there's opportunities for learning from mistakes and things like that. Moving into a leadership role on a fighter squadron must be quite a transition. And I guess, how do you approach that? And how does the sort of experiences that you've had help you to apply to that shift from being one of the guys to the boss? Yeah, I think, um, I don't know, that was almost an easier transition for me than it was later <laughs> in my career when I now was in charge of people that had totally different roles than I did. I think when I was in a fighter squadron and working as the director of operations, like, I don't know, they're all fighter pilots. Like I, I totally know what they do. They know what I do. It was, that to me was almost a uh, more seamless of a transition. I think it became much harder when I was a squadron commander and really more so as a group commander, when I was responsible for now a thousand people and I know what they do by name, but I don't really have the expertise that they do. I mean, I, my group had civil engineers and lawyers and doctors and, uh, you know, people that had these roles, firefighters that I could, I could see and watch what they do, but I certainly didn't have that level of expertise. So I think that's where I felt more, more outside my comfort zone than anything was because, you know, I think I was credible as a leader. I was credible as a pilot, but I had so much to learn about my team and what they did and where they struggled and where I could add value and what I could do for them. So I think that's where I really took the time to get to know them and you know, walk around and try to learn from them and let them teach me about what they do. Um, that for me, I think was a harder transition than just flagging, you know, moving up in the fighter squadron. I think we kind of always saw the natural progression of who was going to mm -hmm. kind of go next into those leadership roles. And um, we had been working together for so long, we really just, we, we kind of watched the natural progression. So I think uh, getting outside my comfort zone and being in charge of people who didn't necessarily look like me or act like me, that was more challenging for sure. Because the thing that struck me as well was in talking about communication was the listening aspect of it and yeah. how, how you would go out and you would you would listen to find out what, what the, the people reporting to you now did, but also listening to the issues that they were facing as well. I guess, and you know, for my terrible experience, you, you kind of think maybe when I'm in that leadership role, I need to project. Whereas you were saying very much that it was the opposite. It was actually, no, tell me what I need to know was the vital aspect. Yeah. I think, you know, you go into a leadership position and I certainly did. And I thought like, well, here I'm the leader. I should have the answers. I should, you know, kind of have this tough exterior. And the truth was like, my team just wanted me to be who I was and listen to them and learn from them. I think, you know, um, <laughs> We sometimes have a perception that's actually not true of what our team wants. And mm -hmm. if you just listen and talk to them and ask them where they need help and what you can do to help, I mean, that goes a long way. Um, I still think you need to be credible and um, have a really strong you know, background in terms of you, the credibility that you bring to the table. But I think those human skills, that human connection is incredibly critical. So you've had a full career. You've done a lot of stuff. <laughs> you've been you've been hit over a capital city of a belligerent nation. Yeah, what advice? <laughs> yeah, there, there's that. What advice would you give yourself? The sort of the the you arriving at the the academy in '93. What what if you could have just sort of five minutes with yourself? What what would you say? I think I would tell myself not to be so hard on myself and enjoy the journey. Uh, it's easier said than done. I think that's mm -hmm. honestly the still the same advice I would give myself at 20, at 30, at 40, uh, <laughs> and maybe even when I'm 50, right, is I, I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. We put a, a lot of pressure on ourselves to do well. And um, I think that's important. It's important because we then ideally take that and work very hard to achieve what we're after. But I think there's this part of it that just, you know, make sure you enjoy the journey along the way. You know, you've got to be able to understand that life is not going to go as planned. I mean, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to fail. You're going to get knocked down. You know, it is all about what you do in the moment. That's what truly matters the most. You know, do you have the courage to get back up again, to, you know, learn from your mistakes, to learn from those failures, to, you know, hold yourself and others accountable? Can you do all of that? And, you know, Look, it happens, and 
um, the key is that we we learn from it and not be so hard on ourselves, not put so much pressure on ourselves, give ourselves some grace when it doesn't go as planned. But I realize that is easier said than done, uh, for sure. <laughs> it is something that I have always you know struggled with throughout my career. Um, but it's worth working on. And uh, it's the same advice I would give my younger self that I would give myself today. Uh, right. We've got a couple of minutes before your husband kicks us off. Um, yep. <laughs> two final questions. What are your memories of the Bing, which is the, the fa I, I hesitate to call it the pilot's bar because it technically wasn't, but it's having seen the fantastic exhibit that they've made of it in the, at the PMA and Space Museum and seeing your your badge there on the wall. Yeah. What, what's your memories of it? It's, you know, it's funny. I, um, so I deployed to Afghanistan in 2002, uh, in 2005 and in 2010. So my experience with, uh, kind of pilot town, the Bing, uh, used to have, the, there used to be these different names. It was, you know, it, and it built up over the years. I mean, it <laughs> was really just some rickety chairs and, you know, some things over the years, a place to hang out and relax. But, uh, you know, I think my memory of, I think every fighter squadron I've been in and on every deployment, like what I remember most is those times we could sit around and relax after what were some incredibly stressful sorties and just like relax and share stories and share time together, whether we were watching Band of Brothers or, um, Oh gosh, I can't even remember some of the other shows that we would watch. Um, but we would just gather around and relax and share stories. And it was like finally just kind of letting some of those stressful moments go. And it was that camaraderie, that sense of team. It's what I miss. I mean, today that's what I miss about being part of a fighter squadron is that sense of camaraderie, that sense of just being part of a team um, and the good times that we spent together in some really bad places. <laughs> I think that's what it is. And the show is The Sopranos. That's what we used to watch, The Sopranos and Band of Brothers. <laughs> so you, you were there when they, when they snuck the TV in because the original instructions apparently were no TV. Ah. Um, we, so where, what I remember was a TV in Iraq and it wasn't a TV. It was a projector that we projected <laughs> against a wall on the outside of our building and sat around in, you know, lawn chairs, uh, watching those films. I get, you're right. I don't think I remember watching so much in the Bing. Uh, it was more of a hangout and chill place. I think fun. our, um, our, our, movie theater, as you would call it, was in the the tower, uh, the air traffic control tower in the bottom floor is where we built up some space there. And, uh, you know, you find you can find a lot of things to do when you have time and you're bored, because when you're not flying, there's not much else to do uh, other than go to the gym. And there wasn't a gym uh, in many, well, in the early days, there wasn't a gym. So you made the most of what you could, uh, you know, and, and we made the most of it. I'm going to squeeze in. You're watching Bad Brothers. Are you looking forward to Masters of the Air? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I think I think think we all are. But there we go. And okay. And you wrapped your your book up with 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 talking about is it your book, which I haven't even said the title of yet, which is Flying in the Face of Fear. You you mentioned that sort of thinking back to when people. Yeah, in, in April 2003, we're asking, were you scared? I guess the question I have to ask up is, is it okay to admit to being scared or do we have to sort of not exude that? Uh, you know, I think it depends on the situation, but I think, you know, the reality of it is that I was. And part of me says, how could you not be scared? Like, you just got hit with an enemy missile over downtown Baghdad. Your airplane's out of control. I mean, like, if you're not scared, there might be something wrong with you. Um, but the key is, that, you know, it's not the fear that matters. It's all about what you do in that moment. And that is what mm -hmm. the book is about, is that we face stress and fear and worry and anxiety in our everyday lives. And it is all about what you do in the moment that matters the most. So it is about flying in the face of fear. It's about having the courage to respond even when you're scared. It's about stepping up and take action in the face of fear. It's about all of those things. Kim, thank you so much for spending the last little while with me. Your book is fantastic and it's been Thank you. a joy to chat with you. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. I cannot thank Kim Campbell enough for joining me on the Damcasters. When I started this podcast, 
I knew I wanted to talk about aviation history. I knew I wanted to talk about planes and things, but the key for me was always the people involved. And from our conversation, I think you could hear Kim's fantastic. And it was great to be able to spend some time with her to dis discuss her career and her book. Now, the book, Flying in the Face of Fear, really is superb, and I can't recommend it highly enough. There'll be links to it in the description below where you can grab your copy. And it's a really positive, really inspiring read. And I mean that not in a sort of trite sort of way. There's a lot of things that are directly applicable to how we can make decisions and better decisions to the challenges we face every day. And it was a great takeaway for me from that. And like I said, that's why the conversation that we had turned out the way it is. As always, the support for the pod is really humbling and I can't thank you all enough for listening. Remember, put some stars into your podcast app of choice. Tell your friends. Tweet about it. Yeah. On that thing that may still collapse. But tell your friends about this fantastic podcast that you found. The host gets amazing guests and he doesn't talk too much. I'll, I'll take that bit out. And of course, yeah, there's Patreon if you want to do that sort of thing. But whatever you can do, I am always terribly grateful. Next week... We continue on the A-10 theme, More Hogs and the Black Jet with John Boyd from one of my interviews that I conducted at the Pima Air and Space Museum back in February. So be sure to check out them. They've been a great sponsor. And as you're going to hear over the next few weeks, the guests that they helped me chat to are quite something. Thanks again to Kim and by the book, Flying in the Face of Fear, it's Ace. Until next time, thanks for your support. And do take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Boney Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.